What is cap training? I do heavy squat. So now I do big jump. It's that easy, right? Nah, just kidding. Let's actually define it. What's going on guys? Today we're going to be talking about post-activation potentiation or PAP for short. This is often a training methodology that's only used for elite athletes or for those in a strength conditioning setting that need a very specific adaptation. But I'm going to talk about how more intermediate and recreational lifters can experiment with this training methodology for certain gains. Now what exactly is PAP? So PAP is a phenomenon by which the force exerted by a muscle is increased due to a prior contraction. So oftentimes you'll see PAP style training in the form of two movements that are coupled together in more of a superset kind of training and they are contrast in nature. So we have like, let's say a very heavy loaded back squat with the plyometric movement. Now, why do these blend together and why is there even a methodology behind the madness of coupling these two seemingly different movements? Well, for starters, the idea is to facilitate a very high neural response or neuromuscular response for that matter to facilitate better performance in the second movement. So as the definition states, let's look at a practical example. Let's say we're doing a heavy back squat. What needs to happen to be able to produce strong reps? Your nervous system needs to increase to be able to manage the load and also excite the body. Then you need to be able to handle that weight so the body is getting to a, ready, a physical readiness that it would not have otherwise if you did not perform any form of loaded movement. By coupling that with then a plyometric movement, so let's say a vertical jump, the idea is to capitalize on that increased neuromuscular drive and excitation to produce a higher and more favorable experience or result in that plyometric and vertical gym exercise. So in layman's terms, PAP essentially is the coupling of two movements and the ideal to take one movement, facilitate a very high excitation, and then capitalize on that excitation with the second movement. All right, so as stated, PAP is a slightly more advanced training methodology. So that being said, we are gonna have some baseline requirements, even if you are an intermediate lifter, that we should try to check before using this methodology. Now note, this will vary based on your individual needs, and in some respects, these are a little bit arbitrary based on not knowing your context, the goals and needs, but these are four that I would recommend having as a coach. So you need a specific goal. If you're gonna use PAP style training, have some idea of how you want to use it. You can be an intermediate lifter and want to improve your vertical jump. That doesn't really matter, but you need a specific goal in order to get the most benefit out of this style of training. Number two is you need foundational strength. If you don't have a freaking clue about what your one RM is for let's say a back squat, then how are you gonna be able to stick within the range of intensity that's recommended for the style of training? So you need some baseline level of strength and understanding of your one RM before using PAP. You also need a balanced program. So PAP can be very demanding on the nervous system, both the PNS and CNS system. So having a balanced program that can accommodate for fatigue to allow you to perform your best is always a very good bet. And then finally, you need experience with the exercises. If you're not comfortable with the vertical jump by itself, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to couple it with a conditioning exercise before performing the, let's say, vertical jump. So you need some experience of performing every exercise you plan on using with the PAP methodology before actually doing it. Now let's dive into the fun stuff, the programming. So we've covered the what of PAP. Now let's talk about the how. You're probably wondering, how heavy should that conditioning exercise be? How long should I rest before I perform that conditioning to subsequent exercise? Those are all great questions. So an old school way of thinking of PAP used to be shorter rest times in between the movements. However, research has started to move away from that and that's for good reason. So it used to be thought that you have to take your conditioning exercise very heavy and rest for a very short amount of time and then perform your subsequent exercise. But now research has started to suggest that a range between 60 to 84% of the intensity of your one rep max is generally a good bet. So scaling in between there based off of your needs, wants, et cetera, is often a better bet than loading too heavily where it's gonna actually fatigue you in the subsequent set. And when it comes to resting in between those exercises, generally three to seven minutes is best. Now that will vary pretty greatly depending on your fitness level, what you're doing, how heavy this exercise is, what the subsequent exercise is, but generally three to seven minutes is the best bet. Now some practical ways of approaching rest time is if you are a little bit limited on time in the gym and you wanna try out PAP or just use it for a mesocycle, try loading a little bit lighter and using a shorter rest time. Whatever's gonna help you perform your best in the subsequent exercise, I would recommend sticking with. 
Now obviously don't go crazy and do 30 seconds and just have your subsequent exercise performance be piss poor. So again, use your best judgment when assessing those. So two variables of the how for PAP is again, intensity between 60 to 84% is generally best and resting around three to seven minutes in between exercises and sets. So we have our loading ranges and our rest time ranges that we want to hit. Now is the fun part. Let's start coupling exercises. And this is where you as an athlete get to work with either your own programming or with a coach to help dictate what movements pairing together will help the performance in the context of your needs and goals. So big thing with PAP is to understand that the two movements should have similar force vectors, AKA they should act upon similar joints and muscles to produce the force and power you're trying to target. So for example, a back squat goes pretty good with a vertical jump. The back squat is a vertical force along with the vertical jump. The sled push, that would be coupled really well with the sprint. You're loading the sprinting movement pattern with the sled push and then you're taking off that load and trying to do a max effort sprint after. Those two generally work pretty well together. A couple more examples could be a clean pull and a broad jump. With the clean pull, you're generating force and hitting triple extension at the top. That could be very similar to the arm swing and force production forward with the broad jump. Another example could be a trap bar deadlift, again with the vertical jump. You're moving force in the vertical movement pattern. Again, with the vertical jump, pairing is usually a pretty good bet there. So when it comes to PAP, Again, try to find movements that are similar in nature to one another. They typically blend well together. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to let's say do a heavy bench press and then a vertical jump. Obviously find movements and plyo movements or conditioning movements that blend well and bleed into one another's movement patterns. All right, so we have our loading, we have our rest times, and we have our exercises. How many sets and reps should we now do for the exercises, intensities, and rest that we picked? So let's look at a couple examples. So let's look at an example of the back squat at 80% done for five reps. We rest for five minutes, then we do a vertical jump for three reps with a max effort. How do we select these reps? It comes down to what's physically capable for you. Let's say you're a little bit newer to the lifting world, but you do have an idea of your one RM. You might want to err a little bit lower with the intensity and the rep scheme because again, the goal here is to produce a favorable response in the subsequent exercise. And if you're being fatigued and the fatigue is accumulating too much based on doing too many reps or too much intensity, then obviously scale it back. So the reps and sets are going to be dictated by what's physically practical for you. Generally though, conditioning exercises will range between like three to five extra, three to five reps. If you go higher than that, fatigue can accumulate a lot quicker. And then when it comes to the subsequent exercise, generally three to five reps again will be a little bit better. I always err towards three reps just because to really produce max effort plyometric exercises or sprints, you don't want to go too many reps because again, performance will start to dip. The whole goal of doing these two together is to maximize this performance, but also mitigate the fatigue interest set in between these two. So again, rest is dictated by what's practical based on the needs of the context of the situation. And if you're confused on how many sets you should perform, think anywhere from like three to five. If you go a little bit higher on the set range, be very mindful of fatigue accumulation and how much you're loading and how much you're doing. But generally three to five sets will be a pretty good bet for most. And that's again gonna depend on the variables that we pick and use within our sets, reps, and loading schemes. Hopefully you were able to take something away from this video. And again, we're only really scratching the surface of PAP style training, but it is a fun methodology that I think more lifters should experiment with to try to get certain gains for specific goals. So three takeaways that I hope you take from this video are number one, you should check the basic requirements needed before using this methodology all willy nilly. So make sure you have some foundational strength. Make sure you have adequate experiments with the exercises you plan on using before using PAP. The second takeaway is that I hope you understand that when using this methodology, your program needs to be balanced. It needs to accommodate for fatigue. It needs to accommodate for the demands you're putting on your body with PAP style training. The third takeaway that I hope you can use is that we should always try to bridge research suggestions with practicality of our own lives. If you don't have the seven, eight, nine minutes to rest in between your sets that some research suggests taking, that's okay. Modify your intensity accordingly and modify your subsequent exercises accordingly. It's okay to play around with reps and sets there if you need to, it's totally fine. Bridge these two together. Obviously, if you're a professional athlete, it's gonna be a lot different. So for you and I, the recreational lifters who do wanna be athletic and produce certain adaptations with the style of training, 
we got to be a little bit practical. So if you want to learn more on this topic, I would highly suggest checking out the article down below in the description. We have it up now on physique.com. This will give you all the logistics about PAP style training and take you through the ins and outs, which I think are really fun to explore when you get to really start practicing and honing in with this in your program.